taken from the scriptures. It's a, it's a really an indisputable fact. You can't, you don't, uh, people may want to debate the resurrection, but, but they don't do it on solid ground if they're questioning it. But the question really is what, how has the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed my life? Has it changed my life? Is it just a historical fact that I acknowledge? Or has the resurrected king, by his spirit, begun a work of resurrecting me? Bringing me from death to life and taking me on my way from this life to the life which is to come. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 16, looking at verses 9 to 14. As you stand with me, if you would, as we read Mark 16, 9 to 14. If you hope you have your Bible, and I hope you have your Bible turned to that. If you don't have a Bible, we've got the text on the screen, but we've got some Bibles in the back. We'll put one in your hand if you ask us after the service. I want you to have your copy of Scripture. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, speaking of Jesus, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were talking, walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May this truth that many of us in this room believe without question, may it grip us anew today in our minds, grip us afresh in our hearts, and may we live, may we leave this place committed to live as those in whose lives the resurrected King is continuing to resurrect us. Thank you. Please be seated. I read a story that Don Fortner put in his book on the Gospel of Mark. He tells, he says, many years ago I read about an old woman, a believer, whose age began to take its toll on her, especially on her memory. At one time she knew much of the Bible by heart. Eventually only one precious little portion stayed with her. I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Soon, part of that slipped from her mind as well. She would be found often quietly repeating what she could of the text. Family and friends would hear her going over it again and again. That which I have committed unto him. Just before she slipped out into glory, her children noticed her lips moving. And they bent over to hear what she was saying. She was repeating just one word. Him. 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 She had lost the whole Bible. But one word. Yet she had the whole Bible in that one word. Him. The book of God is all about Him. We come together to worship Him. We must know, trust, and love Him. May, the, may God, the Holy Spirit, set our hearts on him. Parenthetically, that's what we're doing on Sunday nights. We're looking at all the scriptures, book by book, saying, what does it teach us about him? How does it show us? How is he revealed in this book? If you remember, and it's been, it's been a while back because we took a little break from Mark as we approached the Christmas holidays. If you'll remember, though, the last portion we looked at, the one prior to this, was about the resurrection. And so if you go back and look at your notes or if you go back and look at the uh, sermons that are archived on YouTube, you'll see that the title of that, passage, that message is the same as this, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because we're continuing to talk about it. Now, I need to say about this passage of Scripture, this portion, Mark 16, 9 through 20, but it is debate, it's debated by scholars that whether or not it's even authentic. Um, I had a New Testament professor who was a godly man, and he was teaching Mark when I was in, in seminary, and he said, he said, now when you come to Mark 16, 9 to 20, you enter into what he called, I'll never forget it, the twilight 
of apocryphal literature. <laughs> in other words, he said, you're, it's, the apocrypha is, are books of the Bible and the Catholic Bible that are not authentic, not in the canon. So he was really careful. And so we go back and forth. Is it authentic or not? Well, my position has been, if you've been with us any time at all, that when it, when it shows up in the majority of the translations of Scripture, if I've got to stand and give account to God for preaching something that some manuscripts said was not in there versus leaving something out, I want, to, I want him to chase me for preaching something that was in there. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to 20 tells us some things about the resurrection. Now, the next couple of weeks, we're going to wrap this up, and we're going to get into some really interesting passages, the next passage particularly, about the signs that will accompany those who believe. But we'll unpack that next week. Today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But when you read this, it's not simply, you can tell from Mark, it was not simply a a polemic to convince us of the resurrection, but rather to introduce us to him who is the resurrection and the life. I've told you all through this study that uh, the gospel in action, that Mark seemed inexorably committed to getting Jesus to the cross. And now he's been there. And now as Mark wraps up Peter's memoirs, he wants us to know him who is the resurrection and the life. So we want to see in this portion today just three things. The resurrection is an undeniable fact, verse 9. The resurrection demonstrates an unbelievable reality, verses 10 to 13. And then the resurrection demonstrates an unqualified forgiveness, verse 14. Let's look at this. It's this undeniable fact in verse 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. So, you know, you... It's interesting who he appears to first. We're told of her back in the, in the narratives about her. She loved much because she was forgiven much. In this passage before us, we see three appearances. There are more than three. We're going to, in fact, we're just going to cite them for you today. There are more than three post-resurrection appearances when you weave together Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and a section of Acts. But in these verses we're looking at, he appears to first to Mary Magdalene, then to the two disciples on the Emmaus Road, and then to the 11 apostles. I, I've told you before, I'm amused at, at movements, the women's movement who who want to advance the cause of women. You know something? If you wanted to advance the cause of women, you would attach yourself intimately to Jesus Christ. No one has done for women historically what Jesus Christ has done. Think how scandalous that he would first show himself to a woman uh, who had been demon-possessed, a woman whose reputation was questionable. No one's done more for women than Jesus Christ. And we, his followers, should follow in his train. Three appearances in this passage. You see, the resurrection is critical. We've, we read it in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said it over and over. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, then we are toast. We're wasting our time here today. And your hope's a false hope. And your faith is in vain. But Paul says in that passage, but now Christ is risen from the grave. It's undisputable. And the Lord took great pains to give us evidence. Now, make no mistake. A person will not be saved by simply coming to a mental ascent of the truth of the resurrection. He needs to get there. A person is saved, Paul says in Romans 10. When you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. And Paul tells us why in that passage. For it's with the heart that a person believes and is justified. It's with the mouth that confession is made into salvation. The resurrection is a reality, but for a person to be saved, it's got to become a heart-convinced reality, a life-changing reality, a new birth 
reality. But I want you just to see uh, theological implications where, where in the New Testament, just real quickly, we're going to look at some passages where the resurrection is shown to be of supreme importance. Follow with me now. Just Let's go through these quickly. Romans 1, 1 to 4, where Paul introduces his letter to the Romans that he's been set apart for the gospel of God. And he goes on and says that he promised this beforehand in the prophets and the holy scriptures about his son, Jesus, who was descended from David. He gives the lineage snapshot there. And was declared, look at verse 4, declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. What is, how, do you, how do you latch on to the assertion that Jesus is the son of God? At the resurrection. At the resurrection. Romans 4.25, a little later in that same letter. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. The doctrine of justification means nothing. That is that we are, we are considered as righteous before God, forgiven of our sins, and forgiven as, as right, considered as righteous because of Jesus Christ, who he, did and who he was and what he did. But that's nothing because our justification is tied to his resurrection. Romans 8.34 who is he to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. In other words, the, the notion that, that no one can condemn us when we are in Christ because Christ died and rose and has ascended and is at the right hand of power. Then Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him. In other words, our hope of resurrection, our, our hope that we have been brought from death to life is tied to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 13, 20 to 21, as that, as that sermon uh, to Hebrew Christians closes, now be the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant. Notice the resurrection there is tied to the eternal covenant, that, that covenant that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit struck within the Godhead in eternity past, purposing that God would send the Son to redeem those upon whom the Father had set his heart, that the Holy Spirit would come and apply that salvation uh, contemplated by the Father, accomplished by the Son, would apply it effectually. The resurrection, tied to the eternal covenant. The eternal covenant means nothing without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through. How were you born again? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's, there's no new birth apart from the resurrection. So the theological imp implication, theological significance of this in the New Testament is huge. If the tomb is not empty, if the tomb where they laid Jesus when he died, if it's not empty, then we have no hope. The gospel crumbles and is just sort of an encouraging message. But I want you to see, just we're, going to, we're not going to read through all the passages, there are too many, but I'm just going to show you uh, the witness, the witnesses to the resurrection. You see, in Acts 1-3, Luke says this, that he presented himself alive to them, speaking of Jesus, after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days, and speaking about the kingdom of God. Luke said in writing the book of Acts to most excellent Theophilus, a Gentile nobleman, the resurrection is attested to by many proofs. Look at the historical witnesses, witness within the scriptures. Just real quickly, he appeared first to Mary. We read that in Mark chapter 16, verse 9, and John 20, 16 to 18. He appeared to the women, Matthew 28, 5 to 10. He appeared to Simon Peter. We talked about the significance of that uh, a few weeks ago. Luke 24, 34, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, as Paul is recounting at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, this gospel that he preached, that Christ uh, was crucified and was raised, and he appeared, and Paul gives this list of those to whom he appeared. Peter's listed on them. He appeared 
to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Luke 24, 31, specifically we're told that. Mark 16, which we read, it's, it's, sort of, it's implied that that's who they were, the two on the way. Five, the disciples, these, these 11, there's, there's several, John 21, 1, Matthew 28, 16, and 17, Mark 16, 14, and 15, Luke 24, 44, Luke 24, 50, and Acts 1, 9 to 12. All of these biblical passages speak of Jesus' appearance to the 11. To the 11. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in that early verses, verses there, more than 500 brethren, he says, most of whom were alive when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15, verse 6 is that reference. He appeared to James, 1 Corinthians 15, 7 tells us. And then he appeared to Saul of Tarsus. Acts chapter 9, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Paul says, as one born out of due season. There were many eyewitnesses historically to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You may be familiar that through the years, different people have risen up to write uh, books to challenge the resurrection, to disprove it. They want to blow the, the hoax out of the water and stop this foolishness. And almost without exception, those who seriously investigate the resurrection, no matter how deeply skeptical they have been, become followers of Jesus Christ. One attorney said, I think his book is entitled, Who Moved the Stone? He said, I have seen people convicted in a court of law on less evidence than there is for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The bodily, physical, historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. Paul says in Romans 14, 9, For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Our Lord today, we sang all about the resurrection. He is risen from the dead. He has conquered every enemy. So it's, a, it's an undeniable fact. Secondly, I want you to see it demonstrates an unbelievable reality. And that's, this is the tension here. It's an undeniable fact. And yet we, we see in this uh, narrative that when Mary encounters the risen Christ and goes to tell the eleven, notice what it says. She went and told those who had been with him, that is the eleven, they were mourning and they were weeping because he had died. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them, the two on the road to Emmaus, as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. It, you know, it's interesting. We would like to chide them. In fact, you f fast forward in the book of Acts, and they're having a prayer meeting because Peter has been imprisoned, and they're playing, oh, dear God, rescue Peter. Don't, don't let him be executed. James had been. And remember, the young lady goes to the, to the door. There's a knock at the door. And it's Peter. He's been miraculously released from prison. And she runs back into the prayer meeting, praying for Peter. and said, Peter's at the door. He said, we don't believe you. Whose turn is it to pray now? We're just frail people. We're so frail, so fickle, so prone to stumble. There's a, there's a character in Pilgrim's Progress called Little Faith. And little Faith makes it to the celestial city. But oh, how difficult it is. How difficult it is. So here we have this narrative. And yet we see in the face of this that Jesus does not write them off. People go to them and say, I have seen him. He's alive. I've seen him. No, we don't believe you. We don't believe you. Scripture says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. Two witnesses go to them. The two from on the road to Emmaus. We've seen him. No, we don't believe you. My brothers and sisters... At once, we ought to be rebuked when we, when we show a lack of faith, when, we, when, when doubt seems to lead the, the parade rather than faith. At the same time, though, we need to rejoice that we have a Savior who saves us to the uttermost, who loves us with an everlasting love, who will not forsake us even when we question Him. He is faithful when we are not 
faithful. And so you, this, this unbelievable reality, and the point is that until we are filled with the Holy Spirit and continually being filled with the Holy Spirit, the walk of faith will be a lot of stumbling, a lot of tripping up. But even in that, as we make our way to glory, even in that, be, be grateful. Be thankful. Jesus did not abandon them. He did not go look for others. In fact, the resurrection is it's an amazing truth. It's hard to take in. And Jesus' resurrection, harder still, because if we understand him for who he is, he's the eternal son of God. Which meant he, when he died, that was, that was an unfathomable reality for the eternal son of God not to be alive for a span of three days. So when you look at the human side of things, for someone to come back from the dead, to be raised from the dead. And by the way, I want to make a distinction. These other folks in the New Testament, we speak of them being raised, and I'll use the term, but really they were resuscitated. They were resuscitated. They were brought back to life for a season. Jesus, Jesus is raised from the dead, never to die again. All the others we read about in the New Testament that Jesus raised from the dead, they would, they would face their date with death because he hadn't come back yet. Jesus never dies again. He is raised. He is ascended. He is seated. He is interceding. He is coming back for us. And so let's not chide them too much, though when we look at them, we need to realize and ask ourselves the tough question, what of them lives in me? We're taught in the Scripture to ask in faith, not doubting. He who doubts should not think that he will have what he asks. Oh God, help us. Help us to subdue doubt. Help us to so be gripped by the reality of the resurrection that we will not be the naysayers. We will not be the ones when someone comes and reports to us of your might and your power and your, your glory and your grace for us to be the skeptics. Dear God, don't let us be that. Test the spirits, yes. Not believe every spirit, indeed. Not be uh, gullible to the, to the health and wealth, uh, word of faith, name it, claim it. Crowd, true. But, oh, help us to believe. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And then, finally, what I want us to see. The resurrection demonstrates an unqualified forgiveness. Verse 14. I've already alluded to this, but look at this. This is beautiful. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table. And he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they'd not believed. The reports have been given to them. So get the tension here. Hebrew writer says, Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. He scourges every son that he, that he calls one of his own. In fact, the Hebrew writer goes on to say, if you're not, if you're not disciplined by the Lord, it's proof that you're not his own. You know, the kids all around us all the time. You go into a grocery store, and man, kids can really act, act up. But I don't go around correcting children in the grocery store. They're not mine. But you can talk to my adult children. They'll tell you that I corrected them because they're mine. I wanted the best for them. The Lord does the same with his own children. So Jesus comes. He rebukes them. But his presence there is proof that he is full of mercy, full of compassion, full of forgiveness. And he would, when he ascended back to heaven, send this group out. And they would be imbued with power by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And they would preach a gospel. What is the gospel? Acts chapter 5 tells us that Jesus was exalted as a prince and a savior to give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. In other words, their message was one calling people to repent and promising forgiveness 
to all who repent. And when someone would sin against them, what would they do? They would forgive them. It's the message of forgiveness. Jesus modeled that. He showed it on the cross, remember? There he was hanging there, betrayed, treated to the, to the most incredible act of injustice ever perpetrated upon a human being in the history of the world. And yet from his lips on the cross, in the midst of excruciating pain, anticipating the, the inexplicable pain of the wrath of God being poured out, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus comes with this unqualified forgiveness. If he loves you, if he set apart his heart upon you, if you're really his, no matter how far astray you may go, he will not change his mind about you. There are implications for turning and running from him. No matter how complacent you can become, he is not complacent about you. He loves you. He delights in you. He is committed to take you to be with him where he is. He prayed as much in John 17. I want those who are mine to be with me where I am. I want them to, to experience the love you have for me and the love I have for you. I want that love for them, Father. Our Savior came back from the grave to prove that he is the Savior he declared himself to be. To show that he is the friend. This is what he shows these disciples. He is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. Do you know him? Do you know him as the resurrected Savior? Is he your resurrected King today? Can you look at your life and, and, and look back over your life and say, okay, I, at this season in my life or at this day or date, I confessed Christ as my Lord and Savior and became his follower. And I can look and see where he, the resurrected King, the Lord, has been doing a work of resurrection in me. It was pretty obvious to many of us when he brought us initially from death to life. But he doesn't stop there. He continues by his spirit in dwelling in us, who comes to dwell in us in the new birth. He continues resurrecting us. Is there a deadness? Are there, are there portions of deadness in your life that are being brought to life? Are there, are there pockets of remaining sin that, that are being overcome? Paul said in Romans, in all these things, because no one can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And all these things, we are more than conquerors. We are, we're not just conquerors. We're, we're not just overcomers. There's a, there's a preposition. We are super conquerors, more than conquerors, through him who loved us. Is this your experience as a believer? I'm not talking about some of the nonsense that goes on in the name of name it and claim it. But I'm talking about normal Christianity, walking by faith. Do you see remaining sins, pockets of remaining sin, being subdued by the resurrected King as he continues to resurrect you? I, I want to say this tenderly to you. If you don't see that in your life, you should stop and ask yourself, have I been brought then from death to life? Have I? It's not bad to ask it. You don't have to be ashamed to ask it. It's good. The scripture says to examine yourself, whether you're in the faith. Make your calling and election sure. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, because it's God who is at work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And yet I know I speak to some here today who have never seriously considered this claim. They have never contemplated, have I been brought from death to life? Is there evidence in my life that I'm not who I was, that I've been bought with a price, and that I've been turned to walk in a newness of life. I've been converted. The word conversion means I've been changed. The direction of my life has changed. What is true of you here today? If you say, Pastor, I, it, 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 
It's not what I want it to be, but I see glimpses where Christ continues to bring me from death to life in sanctification. Amen. Press on. Don't be discouraged. Don't let the devil accuse you, falsely accuse you, and lie to you and rob your joy. But if your testimony is, I just don't know that I see that, then don't play with that. Cry out to the Lord even now. Cry out to the Lord even now. Lord Jesus, Son of David, Messiah, Savior, have mercy on me. And he will. He will. He will not cast out any who come and cry out for mercy. He never has. You won't be the first. Let's celebrate the resurrection. The hope for everything that ills our nation right now is for the resurrected king to come to dwell in hearts and lives and begin the process of resurrection in them. And what they need to see from us is to see that we have experienced a saving encounter with this resurrected king. And he continues, he continues to work resurrection in us. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name and we thank you for the day, the Lord's day, every day, every Lord's day is special. We celebrate the resurrection. We gather on the first day of the week because Christ is risen indeed. Lord, help us to live lives of resurrection power. Help us to feel and know what Paul expressed. I want to know him. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. Help us, Lord, to move beyond. We rejoice in the indisputable fact that Christ Jesus has risen from the grave. Lord, may that not only be a historical fact for us, may it be a life-transforming reality. Work in us now. Have your way and do your bidding in each life. Here we pray, starting with me. For Jesus' sake, amen.